This morning, Mike is going to be sharing his philosophy on storytelling. Um, I've, I read an early draft of the book and then I read the, fu the finished product and it's, it's a fascinating book, it really is. And I'm not just saying that because Mike's here beside me. It's, it's an amazing book. Mike, over to you. I'll let you do thanks, it. Thanks, Kian. Thanks, John. So this is my intention for an hour is to um, carry on a little bit further about why stories are important, tell you what the seven stories are and the framework of the seven stories and give you guys, all of you, an opportunity uh, at your tables to work on a story. <laughs> I'm going to, um, I'll start off with, um, with my personal story, which is the first story in the Seven Stories book. So the personal story uh, is the story that you should tell in a first face-to-face -face meeting. It's not the story that you can tell on the phone if you're interrupting someone at their work, but it's the story that you would tell that's going to give your future customer, the person you don't know yet, an idea of who you are, why you do what you do, that you can be trusted, and that you know what you're talking about. And the reason we tell our personal story is to ask a really important question. And the question is, that the question is goes something like this, well, enough about me, what about you? Why do you, why do, you do what you do? What's, how did you get into your role? Because it's really the exchange of stories that's the, that's the clue, that's the central message of the Seven Stories book. So I uh, grew up in Tasmania and I had a pretty adventurous uh, bushwalking childhood. I've been someone who's always loved to travel. And I got a, my first job out of university. I studied as an electrical engineer and I got a job with a company called Schlumberger, which is a, a very large oil and gas services company. If you don't know the company, they're kind of like a Siemens of the oil and gas industry. And my first role was, was running surveys in oil and gas wells. And I graduated to being a, a software specialist. Uh, in fact, I was running one of the very early neural networks in 1995 in London. You, this fancy thing called an artificial neural network, which didn't work at all, I have to tell you. And, and my boss called me into his office and he asked me, he said, he, he started the meeting with this phrase, I have a great career opportunity for you. So anyone who's been in big corporates knows that that phrase is, uh, is a danger signal. And uh, so he said, well, we've got um, a new job. We'd like you to go to Norway and be a salesperson. No, I didn't want to be a salesperson at all. In fact, it wasn't the career I'd mapped out for myself, but I was pretty interested in Norway. But what I said was, well, I can't go because my wife is eight months pregnant. And um, went back and told her about it. And she said, oh, I'd love to go to Norway. <laughs> so we flew on the, the last day that she could fly. And uh, she was giving birth in public hospital because that's the only kind of hospital you have in Norway. And, um, and I was on a very early mobile phone trying to be a salesperson. And I, I closed the biggest deal in our division worldwide in my first year by a complete accident. And I'm not going to go into that story, but trust me, it was happening to meet exactly the right person in the client organisation who sold the deal for me. Uh, but of course... Um, salespeople aren't that good, are we, at knowing what's our skill and what's actually a bit of good fortune. And so I thought, wow, this isn't too hard, this job, and stayed in sales ever since. So that's more than 20 years. And I got to running sales teams throughout Europe. And then my dad wasn't that well and it was time to come back to Melbourne, uh, which is where I live now. And, um, and my CV was international oil and gas and there's no oil and gas industry in Melbourne. And so, you know, what kind of job can I get? So I kind of emphasised the selling in, the, in my CV. And I got a job with Siemens selling mobile network equipment to Telstra. And I used to joke that I was perfect for that job apart from the small impediments of not knowing anything about mobile communications or Siemens products and services or Telstra. But, um, but anyway, that worked out pretty well. I ended up being transferred to overseas again to Kuala Lumpur. I ran a big sales team, 140 people in what then became Nokia Siemens. I changed industry again back into oil and gas because KL is an oil and gas town. And then when I came back to Australia, worked in facility services and ended up changing industry two more times. And that's an interesting experience um, which some of you in this room may have had, which is you're in a situation with a sales target and you don't know the business at all. In fact, you don't even know that you're saying the wrong thing. You don't even know the language of the business. And I've been there now four times. And what I thought when I 
got sick of corporations, which happens eventually to all of us, I think, um, was I would like to see if I could help salespeople speak more naturally, say the right thing in their business conversations. And I started in 2014 with some partners doing that. And if you're serious about it, and this is the engineer in me, if you're serious about changing the habits of salespeople, what you discover is that it is a really difficult thing to do. You can give a two-day training course, you can coach, but if you do what I did, which is call the salespeople up six months later, you get a very friendly conversation. They say, I loved your training. It was brilliant. I really loved how you told me this, this, and this. And you think, right, I didn't tell you that at all. And um, then I ask a couple of questions. What about this and that? And they've forgotten everything. They've forgotten absolutely everything. And that's quite discouraging. But I started teaching a little bit of storytelling early on. And then I realized as I was doing those follow-up discussions that one of the things they did remember was the stories. And that got me thinking about doing something that I'd learned to do in my selling career, but being more systematic about it. And Seven Stories is a framework. It's about being systematic with stories. So that's, that's a longer version of my personal story that I might tell in a first meeting. It says who I am and what I do and why I do it. And I encourage you to think as I'm telling that about how you might present yourself as someone who could be trusted in front of a first contact. So that's the first story. So I'm going to um, just change tax. And Kian and John were talking about why stories are important. And I would like to add a technical, I would like to add the engineer's <laughs> reason for that. Um, so most of you probably have noticed that people who are very good at selling tell stories. Some of them don't stop. In fact, in Seven Stories book, I talk about a couple of the CEOs of companies I've worked with that are what I would call stream of consciousness storytellers. They tell one story after the next all the time. Too much, actually. They tell too many stories. They don't give the chance for the client to even say anything. They are still incredibly persuasive. Most people can't tell those stories. Those guys are the founders of the company. They have all the stories. So one of the central concepts of, of the book is how do we get the really compelling stories out of the mind of the founder or the one or two really key people of the company and spread into a sales team so the salespeople can tell those stories. And that's an interesting problem. I'll talk more about it towards the end. So we've noticed that good salespeople and good leaders are storytellers. But why does it work? And what, what's the technical reason that storytelling works? If you read books on storytelling, and I've read, I think, every one, business storytelling, um, they'll all talk about emotions and what I would call a kind of pop psychology of your amygdala and fear and flight responses and that. And that's not the reason that storytelling is powerful. If you put two fists like that, that's about the size of the biggest part of your brain, the neocortex, the wrinkly part on the outside. Anyone know what it does exactly in a sentence? No, the filter is not really what it does. Anyone, anyone got an idea? So this is like an interesting thing for me because <clears throat> Three quarters of your brain, and no one in this room knows what it does. So everyone can talk about the amygdala, that's your fear flight, the brain stem, that's your autonomous system, running your breathing and your heart rate and all that kind of stuff. But what does that biggest part do? Well, emotions are encoded there. That's true. M memory is encoded there. So a particular type of memory is encoded there. All of our senses connect to that part of our brain. So our vision, our hearing, our um, touch, smell, our sense of balance, our sense of where our limbs are, that's called proprioception. But very importantly, our internal body sense, our sense of our guts and our heart rate, all of that is connected to that part. So you can think that you have eight major sensory groups and they're all connected there. So what's happening in this wonderful piece of our brain which not many people know, is it is a memory sequence prediction organ. What that means is it's inside a dark area of your brain. It, it's got feeding in signals from your eyes, signals from your balance and from your internal. And what, what that part of your brain is trying to do is 
figure out what patterns in the environment are repeating, and if they repeat, learn them, and then predict what's going to happen next. So I'll give you a simple example. If you, from common experience, if you get in your car and switch the radio on, and a song is playing that you know, but it's starting halfway through, I would guess that within two or three beats of the music, you know what song it is, which is extraordinary. You didn't start at the beginning, you start in the middle. And the reason is you have learnt the sequence of those notes and your brain is predicting ahead. You are predicting the next note and the next one and the next one and then you'll probably start singing along or humming or whatever. So that's what this organ is doing. It's predicting what's going to happen next. And here's how it works. As soon as it's learnt a sequence, it doesn't pay attention anymore. The prediction happens subconsciously. So if you walk up to an escalator and it happens to be switched off, do you know that feeling? And then you do this sort of funny falling over, right? Well, um, what's happened is as you come up to the escalator, your eyes are taking in the fact that it's an escalator and the rubber handles, and it's telling your body a prediction. And the prediction is this is how you have to move your legs and your arms to get on an escalator. Right? Now, you don't even know you're doing that. You're predicting and you don't even know you're doing it. But when the escalator switched off, suddenly you're falling. That's a wrong prediction. Now I've got an error state. And now you're really paying attention. So we pay attention when we can't predict. Okay? So, and this is why stories work. We know that stories are unpredictable. We've learnt it since childhood. When we sit down and get a bedtime story, we know that there's going to be a twist. There's going to be something interesting and we pay attention. So attention is the first reason why you should tell stories. You can spend 60 minutes in a presentation, but if your client can predict what you're going to say next, and I have to tell you guys, you all say the same things, so they can predict what you're going to say next, they stop listening. But if they can't predict what you're going to say next, they pay attention. Because we know that stories are unpredictable, they have surprises in them. We do, you don't know what my personal story is, so you listen. And that means that you have 100% attention. These days, everyone has a smartphone. Nobody pays attention much at all. So storytelling is probably more important now than it was five years ago before everyone had a smartphone, 10 years ago before everyone had a smartphone. So this is a technical reason why storytelling works. It's something we all do naturally anyway when we're not in a business conversation, but you know, we think that it's not business-like. So let me just take you through the framework of, sev of the seven stories. Um, this is a classic three-step buying process. You could think of it as a, as a story, actually. That's a, that's a story that a buyer takes from not knowing they have a, a need for anything through to figuring out whether or not there is a solution and then deciding to take a risk and and buy something, which means change themselves, yeah? And the selling process matches it. Ideally, the selling process, I think, I ideally the selling process starts before the buyer knows they have a need. Um, that would be the great place to start. Usually it doesn't. And then the book Seven Stories is written in three parts of a story through the buying process. So if you think about the connection, we can't sell really, until we've made a proper connection with our client. And if you're selling something significant, I think most of you are, that's going to take several interactions with that client. So we need to make a connection, a connection of, of liking and authority and trust. And then we need to fight. So that the analogy here is a fishing analogy, and, and I use a fishing analogy through the Seven Stories book to say that we're going to prepare our lure. That's the story. We're going to try to make a good connection. That's casting and getting a, getting a bite. But then we have to fight. And we have to fight against complacency, against doing nothing, and maybe against our competitors. And then we need to close the deal. And these are three distinct phases of selling. And you need all of them, obviously, to, make, to close the deal. So there are stories for connecting, stories for differentiating, winning mindshare, and stories for closing the deal. So these are the seven stories. The first three, um, I've told you my personal story, and, and, it's, and often people will merge their personal story with their company story. 
Does everyone, everyone here feel that they could tell their company story? Getting lots of nods, yes. If I go on um, websites and search for company stories, so if I do a Google search company story, I get a lot of websites up. I would say 90% of them, when I go to the page that says our story, I don't read a story. I read assertions about this company. Now, it might say we were founded in 1986, so that sounds like the start of a story. And then it goes, and we're in six capital cities, and we're the number one provider of this and that, and that is not a story. So what exactly is a story? I'm going to come to this, and then I'll go back to the seven stories. So by definition, you know, I told you about the brain, right? It's a sequence memory, and it's trying to predict what's going to happen next. If you throw unrelated facts, there's no story because there's no possibility to predict what's going to happen next. So the first critical requirement of a story is a sequence of related events. You have to tell, starting here, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, and therefore this, or it's not a story. Um, about four weeks ago, I was um, sent a document by a friend of mine from a major consulting company. I'm not going to name it, but this is a major international consulting company. And the topic was the importance of storytelling for technical sales. Great. Excellent. So I read it. Not a single story in the entire document. Why am I not surprised? Well, because I'm not surprised because people use the word story and they're not talking about stories. We've kind of, we've bastardized the word a little bit, right? So we've gone from no one wanting to tell stories in business to everyone talking about stories but not knowing what one is, right? So if you don't know that it's a sequence of events, you're not telling a story. And that's the first way they fail. So there's a couple of other things that you need to have in the story. So we start with a setting. And the setting is, and I just told a story. A few weeks ago, I received a document from a major consulting company. That's the setting. It happened a few weeks ago. A time and a place, at least one or two of those things. And then a complication. Well, the twist of that story was a, a document on storytelling that didn't have any story in it, right? Which is a surprising thing. So that's my twist in that story, right? And I'm trying to make a point. I resolve that to make a business point. And the point that I'm trying to make is a lot of people use the word story and they don't know what they're talking about. They're not talking about a story, right? So that's a little mini story in itself, right? So there are actually five important components of a business story, but that's the first. It must be a sequence of events or it's not a story. You should start it with a proper setting. And when I'm teaching salespeople to prepare their own stories, I sort of hammer on this point. Just make a point of saying when it happened and where it happened at the beginning. And what you'll do is you will relax your audience into the story. They'll know that you're going to tell a story. So they just relax and they listen. If you miss that, they may not be listening. They may not, they'll maybe miss the start of your story. So that's important. It should contain a character. Now, most of our sales stories, the character is ourselves or someone in our company or our organisation. Fairly easy to tell. But we're going to talk about success stories where the character is your client, and that's a more complicated story. There must be unpredictability or surprise. If, if your cortex is not... If you, as soon as you easily predict what's happening, you switch off. And it's got to make a business point. Otherwise, it's for the, it's for the bar or the barbecue. OK. So let's go back to the seven stories, and I'll briefly take you through them because I want to do some work with you guys on the table. John, you'll keep me on time, right? Um, the key staff story, so the personal story, just a few things to think about. This is the hardest of the seven stories to prepare, but it's the one that you can use for your whole career. So it's kind of like the most useful. You'll use it all the time, right? The challenging thing about your personal story is it, cannot, it can't be a bragging story. If it doesn't have some vulnerability in it and some acknowledgement of good fortune or bad fortune, it's not a, it's not a very relatable story because you're, you're using it to prompt the other person for their story. And if you set your personal story up as you're a real heroic kind of person, 
you're not going to get a very good story back if you get one back at all. But the key staff story is different. The key staff story is the story about maybe your CEO or your head of implementation or your head of customer service, some other person that this future client needs to trust in the sales process. And you can tell a, a quite glowing story about that person and you'll be positioning them as a person, person your future client will like and trust before they even meet them. And one of the really interesting challenges that I've had as a sales manager, and I'm sure there's people here have had a similar experience, it's the challenge of salespeople not being able to break away from their new client. So they have sold a deal and they're still involved in implementing and helping things out. And the reason is they've set themselves up as the go-to person. They've set themselves up as the most important person as the connection. They haven't positioned the other people in their company so they can't go and do their job. They're, they're stuck implementing and they're not selling. And of course, they end up with a very uncomfortable conversation at the end of the quarter. So this story allows you to do your job. It positions the rest of your organization and it makes your organization seem a lot better as well to your potential clients. It's a very important story. I've already spoken a little bit about the company creation story. It's usually the story about your founder. Who here is from a large corporation, let's say more than 1,000 people? In your company. Significant number, yep. And who's who here is from a, a startup company or a fairly, like a new company? A few of you, yeah. So startup company is normally the, the, the personal story of the founder and the, and the startup are the same story. Big corporations, if you happen to work for Microsoft or uh, Google, everyone thinks they know the story of that company, but they probably don't really. And they probably don't know the story of your division or the part of the business that you're in. Uh, in the Seven Stories book, I tell the story of, of Schlumberger, the, the big corporation I was working for in Russia, which is a very interesting story. I don't have time to tell all these stories, but you, you can read about that in the book. Um, so you can find an angle for your company story to introduce your company, even if it's a well-known company, by telling the story of Microsoft in Australia or Microsoft in the cloud <coughs> or whatever your company is, right? So you tell a, a targeted version of your company story. So those are the connection stories. And these are your chance to be liked and trusted and recognized as someone that knows what they're talking about early in the engagement. Well, that's good. We've got a new friend, excellent. But we still need to get them to change. We need them to change what they were doing now to, to using our products and services. So we move into the fight, stories to differentiate. And I, I have a, a kind of a, in my mind, I have a, a hard line between business development and routine sales. For me, business development is opening up a new market or bringing in a new product and service. And my definition of business development is there is no success story. When there's no success story, when there's no client who's enjoyed the benefits of your offering, you don't have a success story, you're in business development. Not many people are. Less than 5% of people who are in a selling role are in true business development. And it's a very tough role. It's an extremely difficult job to do well. And your friend is the insight story, which is story number four. I'm going to give you an example from the medical industry and uh, so you can kind of hear the structure of the story. So um, the story I give in seven stories, I give some longer ones. I give this one because it's short. Um, in 1982 in Perth, were two medical scientists, Barry Marshall and Robin Warren. This is a famous story, so you might know this story. They were working on um, the problem of stomach ulcers and they had a hypothesis that stomach ulcers were caused by a particular bacteria. bacteria it's called H. pylori. And um, they were, that hypothesis was ridiculed, that they had no chance to present their ideas. They could hardly even get a paper published. And the reason was, it was well known that bacteria couldn't survive in the stomach, in the acidic environment of the stomach, and that uh, stomach ulcers were caused by stress. So that was the conventional wisdom. So, so Marshall and Warren had an insight, they had data, they had experimental proof, but they had no audience for their idea. And in frustration, Barry Marshall did a, a scan, an endoscopy of his stomach, prepared a, a potion of H. pylori bacteria, drank it, 
gave himself stomach, stomach ulcers, scanned again, and treated himself with the antibacteria for H. pylori and cured himself of stomach ulcers and published that paper. Well, that kind of got the idea well <laughs> accepted, right? So now, yeah, and Warren and Marshall won the Nobel Prize in 19, 2005, 2004. So that's an insight story, and, and, and there's some interesting things to think about. So it's a true requirement for insight. By that, I mean your market doesn't know this idea. They should. They need to know it. You have an insight. The market needs to know but they don't accept it. It's outside their understanding. So how are you going to get that across? Well, Marshall took the extreme way of demonstrating it. He actually made himself the subject of the story. There's easier ways than that. So how did your company discover that insight? I call this the researcher's story or the researcher's journey. Now, what happens in big companies is <coughs> They, they do a lot of R&D, they come up with research, and then they bombard the sales department with about 100 slides in a PowerPoint pack with data and all sorts of stuff. But the problem is, like Marshall and Warren, that insight's not accepted. It's not, within, it's not within the framework of your client's minds. They can't accept it. So how did you discover the insight? That's the story. What was the eureka moment? What were the false leads? How did that happen? So the structure is, for the insight story, is like this. The research setting, you know, was your company tr experimenting, trialing? Was there some ser serendipitous uh, occurrence? Fumbling around for a solution, and then, wow, we've got it. We've got this thing, and here's what it means. So those are the four events of the insight story. So some of you here might be thinking about a market introduction right now, or um, a new product and services, or maybe Australia is a new territory for your products and services. So you might like to have a crack at the insight story. I'm going to go on to the success story, and then we're all going to have a bit of a go at it. Um, so if you want to have a go at an insight story, those are, those are the four steps that you need to think about, those four events, and how you would put them together. Yeah? So let's move on to the success story. So six of the seven stories in the Seven Stories book are that four events framework. It's, it's very simple framework. The stories that you will develop will take less than two minutes to tell. They'll take about six minutes to tell when you first put them together. And then your job is to refine them down to two minutes, which is the difficult part of story preparation. When I wrote the Seven Stories book, I was quite keen to get it in the hands of people like John and Kian and uh, people who, who really know selling well. And um, so I connected with quite a few people around the world. And one of them was um, a guy called David Masova. He's based in Budapest in Hungary. And um, David is an interesting guy. He had been a sales leader in Silicon Valley and worked on several startup companies. He's American by birth. And then he got into, he's a real expert of the sales process. He's written two textbooks on sales process. He went to live in, uh, in Budapest uh, because that's where his wife is from. And, and then he found himself in a situation where he could no longer easily consult with sales teams because there weren't any in Budapest. So he decided to change his business. He decided to use LinkedIn to connect directly with salespeople and coach salespeople wherever they were in the world. So that's quite a clever business idea. Um, but he didn't find it that easy, in fact. Um, what is the conversation? How do I connect? How do I do that with salespeople? And if you've been in consulting, which is what I do and Kian and John, you'll know that um, trying to work out the best way to sell your products and services, that's unpaid work. Most of you probably get paid to do that, but if you're a consultant, that's unpaid work. So David was in that situation and he I sent him, I connected with him, we had a video conference, I sent him a manuscript of seven stories. About a week later he wrote, he wrote back and said, Mike, this book is brilliant, I love it, and I've incorporated my personal story and, my ins and an insight story into my conversation with salespeople. And he said, exactly like you say in the book, they start telling me their story and we make a connection. And it's, that's brilliant, and I'd never thought about it. And that's a guy who's written a book on sales process. That's a success story. 
There's six parts to it. This is, these are the parts. So I didn't start actually talking about me. I started talking about David and I told you something about David. So I painted a picture of him as a person and then I moved on his past success and then I moved on to a problem he had. And his problem was he was changing his business model. He was no longer selling training to sales teams. He was going to sell individual coaching to salespeople and he had to figure out how to do that. Meets a guide, that's you. You're the guide in the success story. You're not the hero. The guide was me, and, and, and I gave him a plan, and the plan was the book, actually. So the book had the plan how to do this in it. Now, you probably will have a different way to give your clients a plan, but that's what you'll do. So you'll meet them, you'll give them the plan, we'll describe the plan, and then this is an important thing. We've got to avoid failure. Now, I talked about avoiding failure in that story when I told you that if you don't figure out your sales process and you're a consultant, you're not getting paid. That's failure for consultants. Not getting paid and not being able to get new clients is failure. And we're avoiding that and we're achieving success. So what I'd like to do now is a little exercise with you guys. Um, I'd like you to think about whether you would like to put together either an insight story or a success story for your business. Now, when you're talking about these with your table and you'll be talking with people you don't know that well, you're typically, you don't need to give the name of the company or the person. And that's an important thing with success stories. You need to protect your client's confidentiality very often. Some would say, I was working with the CIO, let's call her Sue. I don't have to say the name of the company, but then I'm going to give quite some details of that journey. In your handouts are two templates, I think. Um, there's, um, there's a template for the insight story, which is the four parts. What I suggest you do is start thinking about your setting and how it ends first, and then start filling in these, and then give your story a name. Names of stories are very important. Names help you remember them afterwards, right? So your choice, so I'd like you to just start for three, four minutes on your own, just writing out either an insight story or a success story. If it's a success story, see if you can fill out each of the six parts, what your successful client, their situation is, and there'll be, uh, I'm going to hand out some books for whoever's brave enough to, uh, to tell a story a bit later on. Um, and then after three or four minutes, I'm going to get you to talk about your story with the group and just share, share internally the stories and, and we'll see who thinks they have a good one. Who has chosen to, to work on an insight story? Okay, so that means the rest of you have chosen to work on a success story. That's good. No, normally that's the case. Normally we have, if you've been in business for a while, you should have successes. Okay. Is there anyone dying to tell a story? There's a book in it for you, if you are. No bribery or anything. Was anyone would like to tell an insight story, for example? Yeah. Who has an insight story? Yes. Tracy. That's it, Tracy. Stand um, up if you don't mind, Tracy. That'd be great. I'm Tracy. Um, I'm actually from Amazon Web Services. Um, my insight story was in 2005, I was living in Sydney, I was working in IT and I had what I call my young life crisis where I decided I would set my own small business up. Um, I persevered with it for about four years until the GFC hit and we just really broke even. In fact, many months I would lay in bed and think, how in the, am I going to pay the rent this month? So it was a really kind of grounding experience. I started taking cask wine to people's barbecues, which they wouldn't drink, and then I'd drink their bottled wine. I do remember that as a distinct memory. Um, and I guess the turning point for me is when the GFC came, it really forced me to think, I'm going broke now, I really have to sell. So I sold, and I moved back to the corporate world. And coming back to the corporate world, I realised actually how much I loved it. And since then, I've had a great career. Two of my jobs I've gotten because of my small business experience. They've looked at my resume, and I guess I've stood out because of that. So although I still have some scars financially, I'm sort of recovering now. I guess uh, it's really taught me a lot about appreciating what you have and uh, working in the corporate world and the benefits that it can have. Thanks, Tracy. So 
But, so what often happens with storytelling is we, we merge them together. So the framework of the book is to think about, help you think about what sort of story do I need now in my sales <coughs> journey, right? And Tracy told a personal story about the insight. The insight you got was what it's like to be a small business and how you could use those insights. What I, if I was quizzing you and coaching you, I'd want to get out of you a little bit more about what exactly is it that you learnt in small business that you could reapply back into big business? What, and how did you get that insight? Because then you're really delivering that message. But it's very engaging to hear, OK, someone had that experience. And when you give a story like that, you will be sparking in the mind of your future customer some similar kinds of stories that they'll want to bring out and tell you as well. Did any, who has, would like to do a success story? Do you have a success story? Yeah. Um, this is not about me, but... Good, because a success story should not be about yeah, you. <laughs> it's probably success and, and sort of lost opportunity in, two, in one story. Anyway, back in the 90s, um, a gentleman, if anyone plays golf, does anyone play golf here? Great, so we all know the brand Callaway, right? So back in the 90s, a guy in the US invented a, a, a two ball putter. And it was, what it was, it's, it's sort of two white indents in the back of the putter. Your ball lined up in the front of it, made a three ball, made it easy to putt. So he went to Callaway for a license deal. They offered him two possible scenarios. One was 250 grand on the table, walk away. The other one was $3 a putter. The guy was a bit sort of, you know, tight, you know, scared, took the 250K. Um, to date, they've made approximately 200 million two ball putters. <laughs> <laughs> they offer him three bucks. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. Craig's story would be the perfect story for someone who is representing inventors to corporations. So let's say that um, you're, you know, you're, you're bringing, you're the Shark Tank guy and you're, bring, you're trying to advise inventors about how to deal with a big corporation, right? And you told Craig's story about the inventor that didn't know how to take the right deal. That would be the perfect success story, particularly if you were able to say, well, I persuaded him not to take that deal and to take this other deal and, and he achieved success because then you would have the, the avoid that failure of the other guy and achieve this success. It turns out that success stories take a bit of practice to get, to get right. Um, we have a tendency to inject ourselves into the success story too early in the process. We don't set it up. If you think about it, your future customer is not that interested in you as a person, that they're very interested in people like themselves. They're very interested in someone who's in business like them with a similar problem. So if you set this story up, the right way as um, you know this is someone like you in a situation that you've probably experienced and here's how they met us and here's the plan and here's how we didn't screw up and here's how we achieved success if you set it up at the beginning it'll go much better the three-part case study which we see all over websites everywhere is not really a success story because that usually starts off situation and then they tell a generic situation and we don't learn who the customer actually is. We don't learn who that person is. And then they go, what we did. So the second part of a, six, of a case study is what we did, you know, and then so we did this technical thing. And then it goes, resolution. Here's how wonderful it is. But those three parts are not an interesting story at all because there's no avoid failure in that story and there's no character. So marketing, marketing departments are scared putting success stories in a way that's relatable because they're worried about, you know, I can't use the client's name and I can't use them personally. But salespeople, we can tell success stories and we don't have to name our successful client. We can just say, you know, I'll call them Fred, I'll call them Sue, whatever, and, and your client will go for the journey. But it's not a three-part case study, this. It's much more sophisticated and it works a lot better than a case study. So a lot of people, when they hear the word success story, they think case study. This is not a case study. Let's do one more. Who would like to give either a success story or an insight story? Who's, yes? I've titled the story A Daughter's Bequest. And I've just joined up with a company called Adapt. And some of you may know Jim Berry. 
And Jim interviewed me about five months ago, and his first question to me was, or his first statement to me was, I have an eight-year-old daughter, and I want her to be able to work in a country of Australia which is competitive on the global stage, and I want to provide Australian organisations with the ability to be successful globally. So that was his opening line to me. And so Jim's story was, the message is be true to yourself. Jim was working for an American company in the mid-2000s in Sydney, and he knew the product and service they offered was good, but he thought the company was totally unethical. It was immoral in how it engaged with people, it lied, it was unscrupulous. And Jim said to his people around here, we can do better than this. And so Jim got the group together and they moved away from the company. And the big, com big American company threatened legal action, you know, restraint of trade, all this sort of stuff. So Jim had to go to lawyers and see how do we navigate this sort of circumstance to come out of it. So 10 years on, Jim is turning over a company close to $10 million. He's employing 30 people. And I have to say, he's the most impressive manager I've ever met. Very good. Thanks, yeah. Peter. Let me give you a book. <laughs> Peter's story. So again, it's interesting. It's stories about people, right? We like to hear about stories about people. Now, if, supposing you had been part of the success of Jim in that story, that would be the bit to inject in as, you know, this is how I helped him, right? So if you're thinking about constructing your success story, every one of those six events is important to structure it in. This is something that I've learnt about stories, by the way. There aren't that many great stories for your company. There's lots of average ones. There aren't that many great stories for your company. So if you th and by great, I mean when you tell them, they really hit, like the people, you can really tell that, that, wow. And so spending a bit of time to collect even three or four great stories for your company has a huge leverage because it's not just you telling the story, it's them telling your story to someone else inside their organisation who tells it to someone else. Now that only happens with the really good stories. So what I hope to I'd hope to inspire you to do is to start thinking about what are the really great stories in our company? Who has them? How do I get them? Because they're the ones that you want to nurture and, and make sure that all your salespeople hear them. Okay, I'm going to move on to the... So we talked about insight stories and success stories. So those are the stories for fighting. Those are the two stories that help you win mind share and change the mind of your future customer. But we still haven't closed the deal, right? If it, who's, who's here is selling where the deal size is above a half a million dollars deal size or even 250,000, some people here? Yeah, so, so you, you know that, um, you know, for that size of deal, there isn't, you know, maybe even the CEO doesn't have signing authority to just say, I'm buying that thing, right? There's a buying committee. There is a process to get through. And you've been working with people all the way up to either a tender or a proposal. And you've got to know the people who have the, the desire for your products and services, who want to make it happen. But they've got to internally persuade in their company to make it happen. And this is the point in sales where we start to get locked out of the process. We don't have great visibility anymore. And the bigger the deal, the more that's true, the more you're completely locked out. So how can you use storytelling to help you in that phrase? So you've, your success story and your insight story will still work for you because if you've, do, if you've got a really good insight and success story, those will get used in those stakeholder meetings as well. But there are two stories that uh, I came to learn about kind of by accident over the last few years. The first one I call a value story. The value story explains to your future customers how your company behaves when things go wrong. Now, I work for uh, seven years for German multinational company Siemens. And when I joined them, I, as a new salesperson, so I didn't understand them as a company, and they're 
German. They're very engineering focused and they're a very commercially minded company as well. And I couldn't understand how they sold anything because the marketing was terrible, I thought, and there wasn't a sales culture to speak of. You know, I was used to a more salesy kind of culture. And I'm like, why do these people buy anything? And then I started hearing some stories about projects, and these are really significant projects. And I'll tell you a story from my experience. I was in the Siemens Australia country manager's office, and he took a call from the Victorian state government. And at that time, in the news, was a, a particular failure going on. So Siemens was involved in the BassLink project, which is an electricity cable that goes connects Victoria to Tasmania under the Bass Strait, 400 kilometres. And Siemens part was providing the inverter transformers at each end that transform AC to DC electricity. And the ship that was bringing those transformers to Australia from Germany hit a storm in the Southern Ocean, broke its rudder, and all six of these massive transformers were, were smashed and, and needed to be rebuilt. And the lead time, the rebuild time was 18 months. And so suddenly you've got this huge bit of public infrastructure and Siemens was in the news. They were in the television and it's back in 2005. <coughs> and so Albert was, t Albert was taking the call and then we talked about it afterwards and he'd said to me, you know, um, the, he called the Siemens board and they got it on a fast track. They actually rebuilt those transformers in five months. And um, the Siemens board didn't ask about litigation or anything like that. You know, who are we suing for the ship? It was just like, we need to build six more transformers. And the, old, the, the project itself was delivered on time. That's a value story. That's a story about how does your company behave when things go wrong. The hospitality industry has a lot of these sort of stories. You know, I kind of like the the lost wallet or the lost passport on the front desk of the hotel and the, the bellboy drives to the hotel to give it back to you and those kind of stories. The values there are values of service and honesty and ethical behaviour. These stories, have a, they do a lot more work than you might appreciate. And here's the thing, your sponsor is in a stakeholder meeting, maybe the CEO's there, there's representatives from finance, project, there are other business leaders who would like to have the budget for the thing that you're selling. They don't want your project. And someone says, what if it doesn't work? And your sponsor goes, but, but it's Siemens. Now, they don't need to tell the story. Their tone of voice will tell you how convinced they are. They've heard the stories, right? So they know the stories about what it's like, this company. So these are stories that persuade in a way that you may not appreciate. Uh, and I certainly used those stories when I was with that company and with other companies. The final story, the seventh story, is really the sales manager's story. There's an old saying in sales which is, you need to teach your customer how to buy, meaning you need to teach them how to buy your products and services. And sometimes that's teaching them how not to make a mistake and buy the wrong thing. And the second part of it is, you need to teach your customer how to sell. Because once you've interacted with them and they're persuaded, they need to sell for you in that stakeholder meeting. And they don't know how to sell. Not many people do. You know how to sell, they don't. So how are you going to teach them how to sell? Well, if you've made a good connection with your hook stories and they trust you, you will still be talking to them through the time when you're not supposed to be talking to them. I've never won a big deal where I wasn't talking to my sponsor through that deal the entire way through the thing. Let's call that an open secret of selling. Which means that you have the possibility to be their sales manager and tell them a story about how to get past, for example, a difficult person. And I'll tell you a story from my experience which I've used as a sales manager. So I was working um, uh, pre-Apple iPad, iPod, before music download was really a thing, on a music download service for a big media company. And this is a, it was a multi tens of million dollar deal, and it was a, going to be a revenue share. So it was a very collaborative exercise. And we spent some months with tens of people from Europe uh, here in Australia, and tens of their people working on the technical aspects and the business model aspects of that deal. And then it came down to signing the contract. And we were all marched into the 
corporate headquarters, a big negotiating room and 10 of our people sitting there and 10 people on the other side that we knew quite well. And then the chief negotiator from our client sat at the head of the table with all the documentation and proceeded to just pull the deal completely apart, demanded ridiculous, the price had to be half, we needed availability of 99.99%, 99.9 wasn't good enough. And, and it was aggressive and rude and threatening and litigious. And I remember coming out of that first meeting and thinking, wow, we are not going to sign a deal. And I went back and one of the uh, more experienced sales guys to me noticed the look on my face, I think. And he said, you know, what's wrong? And, and I said, well, you know, it's this guy, he's just pulled the whole deal apart, you know, and it doesn't work that way. He said, well, ring him up, don't have a chat. Had, the idea had not even occurred to me. <laughs> really? So I did. I spent two hours in his office going through the deal. And, you know, we reconvened the meeting, I think, about a week later, and he did not skip a beat. He didn't change. He was the identical person, and he skirted around all the non-negotiable aspects of the contract, and we got the deal done. And that's a sales manager's story. That's the story that you can use. That's the st sort of story that you can use to teach your sponsor how to get through. And there are different, I would say, standard problems that we face. I think you know the people who have closed the biggest deals in your company, they know what these typical roadblocks are. People who don't understand the cost of delay. People who are egotistical and causing problems in stakeholder meetings. Straight out resource conflicts. If you have been there with other clients and you've collected some good stories, you can use those stories to give your sponsor the confidence to get through that. They now know the how to do it. You're being their sales manager, if you like. It's the most sophisticated story in the book, um, and it is for sales managers. But this is how big deals get done, actually. So. So those are the seven stories. I'll give you a summary, and then I'll take some questions. And then if we have time, we can even have another story. Let's see how we go. So the stories are stories to connect, to hook. Story, the purpose of those stories is to create liking and authority and trust. Because when you get into the next step, which is the fight, which is differentiating and getting mindshare, why your solution and not someone else's, or why you and don't do anything, you need to be trusted by that point. You, those stories don't work so well if you're not trusted. You know, tell a success story and they go, yeah, well, you would say that. Or did you just make that story up, right? But if I trust you already, then I listen to the success story. So connection is critically important. Key staff story. Can you position other people in your staff? Well, the answer to that is no, you can't unless you know their story. Knowing somebody else's story is a minimum one hour exercise of interviewing them, taking notes, and then condensing it down into a two minute story. You have no chance of, giving, of doing a good job of someone else's story without at least that amount of time, probably longer. Um, can you tell your company story? Most salespeople cannot. Most sales leaders don't really know their company story. Most companies fail. 90% of companies fail. So why did your company succeed? Do you know? Was there one first critical client? Tell me that about that. Did you nearly fail? Did you go bankrupt and recover? I don't know. But there's a story there. I'll guarantee you there's a story. And the answer, we're the number one and we're in six capital cities and all that, that is really boring. All your competitors, they say that. But if you could tell the narrative of your company, and that is a few days of work, in my experience, to get a good company story together. You need to look at company records, you need to get your dates right, you need to interview the founders if they're not around anymore, you need to talk to people who know the company history if you've been in business a long time. It's a bit of effort. So those are the connection stories. And then we're going to fight. By far the easiest way to fight is with a success story. And that's 95% of selling. We're selling to people who are like other clients that have succeeded with us, yeah? That's mostly what we're doing. So we make a success story and we make it about that other client. If we're in the really tough job of selling pure BD, we've got to have an insight story. The facts and figures don't persuade. We've got to tell the story. And the story is, how did we get that insight? Because that's teaching. 
then, when, then we're teaching our future client the same thing that they need to learn, right? How did you learn it? I'll teach you how I learnt it. That's the insight story. And then we've got to get the deal closed. Are you the kind of company I want to do business with or not? What stories show the values of your company? And then how do I actually get a difficult deal done? Can I teach my client how to do that? So that's the seven stories. Um, I'll take a few questions and then I'll talk a little bit about, uh, let's just, maybe I'll summarize and then I'll take some questions. So I didn't talk much about story library, but it should be obvious to you that if you put a lot of effort into collecting three, five, ten really good stories for your company, that you want to keep them somewhere. And the best way to keep them is to get your iPhone out and video someone telling it, because that's the natural way. That's how salespeople will learn from that much better than writing it down, and then post it on your intranet in a story library. So that's what I do with all my clients. I found I have to do it for them. I don't know what it is about sales departments, but sales teams are hopeless at systems. Anyone else notice that? <laughs> hopeless at systems. Marketing, marketing is better at systems, guys, I have to tell you. Um, so you need a story library. So collect your stories up. And these are the minimum stories you should have. Your company story, insight stories, value stories. And then if you've been in business, if you're not a startup, your number one job as a startup is to get a success story. That's job one for a startup. And as soon as you've got a success story, selling is a whole lot easier. We know that, right? So, it's, so those are the four stories that your library has to have. And I'll just summarize and say that it's not about telling great stories. It's about getting into the style of conversation with your future customer where they're comfortable to tell you their stories. Because that's when you really learn about your client. When your client tells you stories about things that go wrong in their company, you're really starting to connect. And you're really learning about their business. So you're going to learn about your future client by hearing their stories. So you're using your story, you're putting it out there in a certain way to get their story back. This is how great salespeople sell. This is what they do all the time. Even if they don't know they're doing it, this is what they're doing. That's me done. Thank you very much. <laughs> Your last comment there at the end, Mike, was really interesting. Even if they don't know they're doing it, I think for the last 20 years I've been telling stories as, a, as an Irish person without actually understanding the science behind why I was doing it. But it's really interesting to hear it unpacked. Um, do we have any questions for, for Mike while we have him here in the room? Yeah, thanks very much for that. Um, Look, you know, it, when you're selling uh, like a large enterprise deal and you come across uh, a block, like so you, if you're lucky, you've, you've hit someone at a senior level. If you're not, and you're dealing, say, with a middle level executive and they're a blocker, is there a story that's appropriate to moving around the, the blocker? The story I told is a kind of a blocking situation. You know, the, the blocker in that story was a guy who didn't know what kind of contract he was negotiating and, um, and he needed to be taught that. Um, and th that the story of taking the, taking the blocker aside and really understanding why they're blocking and what's going on, you know, I, I mean, I think it comes back to the sales management kind of approach, you know, what's the agenda of that person and why are they doing that and can we find out, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really difficult common situation. But my approach generally has been to uh, to find ways to persuade around them rather than to use your very senior connection to smash your way through because um, you know projects can really fail after you've signed the deal when you've got people who are fighting actively against it through the, through the process. But it's, it's a really valid question. How do you translate uh, a story from one industry to another where people say, uh, look, that's not really relevant to us? Different industry. Yeah, and that, that's, that's the classic problem of you don't have a success story, right? Or your yeah. success story doesn't seem relevant to that industry. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, well, first thing I would say is recognise and make sure your stakeholders understand that you are in a difficult situation, that that's not normal sales. So I, I've, I've consulted in many situations where I've needed to 
just to explain back up to the senior people in the organisation that you are putting too much pressure on this sales department. You don't understand why this is so difficult. So that situation is, the reason that most startups fail is because of that. They couldn't get to a success story. So the only answer is the insight story. Sorry, I missed your name. Anthony. Anthony. So you need to be able to tell a compelling insight story, which is teaching them that the thing from that other, you're teaching them the thing from that other industry can work for them. And here's how you know. Here's how you learnt that. Here's how I learnt that that thing, and this is how I, so that's, that's the only story I know that can work there. And it's still hard. So I don't know if that helps. <laughs> Matt. Matt. Yeah, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I just wanted to get your take on uh, how important you think it is the order of, of which you tell the stories. So, um, you know, in, in what sort of situation of the sales cycle you're in as to what story sure. you tell. The, there's, yeah, so the question is like what order to tell them. And this is one of the challenges when you write a book, right? Like, how do I structure my book? So I chose to structure the book on a buying journey, you know, starting from I don't know them. But I chose to structure it probably more from my experience of selling with big companies. And when, when you work for a big company, you can generally get a first meeting. So your business card gets you a first meeting. But there are many companies that struggle to get a first meeting. So I'm quite conscious of the fact that I didn't start the book for those guys. So you can't, you can't reach out to someone you don't know and call them up and interrupt them and start telling your personal story. I mean, that should be obvious, right? <laughs> um, so you have, to, um, you have to cut into the middle. You have to start with your insight or success story on the first reach out. And then when you get the first meeting, step back to your personal story and your company story or your key staff story, get a nice connection, and then go into details on the stories, right? So the sequence is a little bit different if you're on the first reach out. So I coach, I coach salespeople to, to lead with their success story, but you don't need to lead with the answer. If you, if you lead with the start, they want to hear the rest of it, particularly with voicemail. I know most people hate leaving voicemails, but if you leave the start of your success story on the voicemail, they may not call you back, but I guarantee you they want to know how the story finished. They really want to know how the story finished, right? So that's interesting, right? So you have about 20 seconds if you're going to phone someone up who isn't expecting your call. And in that 20 seconds, you, there has to be a very good reason why you're calling them, right? So I'm calling you because someone like you had this experience. That's your success story. I'm calling you because our research department has made this ama amazing discovery with, I'd like to come and talk with you about it, right? It's the start of the story. That's the interesting thing, yeah? Yeah, so you're fighting with your insight stories and your success stories. You're connecting with your company story and your personal story. I don't know if that helped you. And, and the other stories really are special purpose. You can tell value stories in your first meeting, you know, that's for sure. That they can be extremely, depends on how long the meeting is, how much time you have. You need to allocate three or four minutes to get a, media, to get a story across, right? So you have to judge the timing. Just one question. Earlier in you t spoke about enough about me, what about you? Yes. When you go into a meeting and you, you present your story, do you ever let the client come back and give you a story that then you can then go back and find one of those stories that you have that relates to that? Is that a...? Yes. Well, this is the thing. This is why it's so hard to teach salespeople, right? Because it's such a dynamic environment, a conversation with a client, right? But. I, I tend to think about, so there's different ways I can tell my personal story and depending on the industry, because I've worked in a few industries, I'll probably pick different parts of my personal story. Um, but what I've noticed is what you choose to put into your story is what you're going to get back from them. So I use that almost diagnostically. So I, would, I really like to share personal things in my personal story because I've discovered that people will tell you something personal about themselves when you do, and I just think that's a better way to be connected. So when I say my wife was eight months pregnant before we went to Norway, it's personal, right? And they might tell, tell me about their kids and that kind of thing. I'm not sure I'm exactly answering your question, but, but I'm, I'm certainly once they start telling me their story, I'm going to be guided by what they say. You know, I might choose to tell another story. 
we might spend 30 minutes sharing personal stories. That is perfectly fine because if you're on a sales engagement that's going to take several meetings, and obviously the bigger the sale, the more likely that is, to spend 30 minutes sharing personal stories was, is a fantastic thing as far as I'm concerned. You agree? Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, everyone else. Can I get one more round of applause for Mike Adams, please? Thank you.